it's Adam here for PC Monitors and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on-screen display menu system of the Philips C26M6 VJRMB. The OSD is controlled by a joystick at the rear of the monitor towards the right side. You can see that there. There's also a little power LED there. You can see that glowing white and it flashes white if the monitor enters a low power state so you lose signal to the computer. You can't disable the power LED in the OSD, but it's not particularly bright and it's not obnoxious, so I wouldn't really worry about that too much. The first feature I'm going to go through is Ambilight, and the reason for that is that some people look at this video just to see this feature. So you can see it will flicker on the video, that's because these lights do use pulse width modulation, unlike the main backlight of the monitor. So you can see flickering in the video, but Generally, you won't really notice this. It just gives a little bit of a glow underneath the monitor and a bit behind it, towards the bottom at least. You can see the LEDs there. And I do apologise about the flickering on the video. I can't really do anything about that. But the setting is in the main OSD, has its own little section of the menu, Ambi Glow. And you can set that to brightest, which is the setting I'm using now. Brighter, which is a bit dimmer, or bright, which is a bit dimmer again. Has different settings. Auto mode just cycles various colours. Or you can set it to user define, which allows you to set the colour yourself. So there's white, red, rose, magenta, violet, blue, azure, cyan, aquamarine, green, chartreuse, yellow, or orange. So quite a nice little spectrum of colours to choose from there. I kind of like just setting it to red sometimes, or white if it's a bit earlier in the day, or perhaps orange or yellow. Orange is sort of really like a warm white. It's um, hard to show you the exact colour in a video, certainly, and that will depend on many different things, but Sort of a, a very warm white, really, so I like using that in the evening sometimes as well. So now I'm going to move on to the OSD itself and the control system. So the joystick can be a bit of a stretch when you're just sitting at the desk to actually use, and certainly when you've got a tripod in front of your desk and you're trying to record a video, very tricky indeed. So I'm just basically standing up, so I might sound a little bit weird on this video, it's because I'm actually standing above the camera. but. As I said, it's a bit of a stretch, unless you've got orangutan arms. I really do sort of have to stretch quite a bit when I'm using this system. And it's a little bit annoying for that reason, but you don't have to go into the OSD too often, so it's not a big deal really. The actual control of the joystick's fairly intuitive. If you press it up without entering the main menu system, you can quickly select the input used by the monitor. Left allows you to change to one of the smart image game presets. Various different options. Some of these are explored in the review, but all these really do is change the options in the OSD to various settings. And the FPS just gives you a very sort of cool, overly sharp look to the image. Racing looks too green and too cool. And I don't mean cool as in a good thing, I mean cool as in the colour tone. RTS, it's a bit better balance, but Basically, I don't really like these presets, but when do I ever like presets? You'll also notice the RTS mode has a little box towards the left by default. That's actually something you can tweak in, I believe it's FPS, Racing or RTS, perhaps Gamer 1 and Gamer 2 as well. And there's something in the picture section of the menu called Smart Frame. And you can change the size of that, the position and the brightness and contrast levels. The brightness has not the digital brightness, it doesn't adjust what the backlight's doing. So really it's just designed to highlight a particular area of the image and the reason it's there by default for RTS is because it might highlight your map. So that's what that does. Gamer 1 and Gamer 2, these have potential to be useful and I say that because you can adjust various settings and easily recall them so you can have two different sets of settings. I do have a bit of an issue with them though. The sharpness is lower than it should be and you can adjust the sharpness in the main menu system. It's set to 50, which is the neutral point, but it, it looks too soft. 
um, and if you set that to 60 it becomes overly sharp so you'd need it between 50 and 60 in game one and game two for it to look correct but unfortunately it doesn't and I don't use them for this reason um, and I don't know if that's just a bug with my unit perhaps it'll something that will like, fix with later firmware it's not a massive issue um, but it is a bit annoying it's not something which I experienced in when I had smart image game set to off which is my preferred setting and I prefer just tweaking things manually there's low blue mode and that's the low blue light settings of the monitor I'll go through them in the main menu system smart uniformity which is a uniformity compensation setting so that evens out the luminance at various different areas of the screen to have it more uniform and that's explored in the written review or off my preferred setting if you twiddle the joystick down, you can adjust the volume of the integrated speakers or anything connected to the 3.5mm jack. There are some other audio settings and I'll go through them in the main menu. I'll open that now. So you can see Ambiglow, which I've gone through already. Low blue mode. If you have this set to on, you can set it to various different intensities. One being the weakest setting, two being stronger, three being stronger again, four being stronger again. These are explored in the calibration section of the written review, but they do work effectively. That's useful in the hours leading up towards bed when you should cut out stimulating blue light as much as possible, or just if you prefer to have a more relaxing viewing experience at other times as well. Input allows you to select the input used by the monitor. Picture, which is sort of the main settings really. Various different settings here. HDR, you can set the HDR mode to normal or VESA HDR 600. These are explored in the review. Normal has a lower peak luminance than VESA HDR 600. And the offsetting, as you'd expect, will just forcefully disable HDR even if you're trying to run HDR content. If you're running normal SDR content, as I am now, it doesn't matter what you have the HDR setting set to. It'll just ignore the setting. Brightness, you can adjust that. You can adjust the contrast. Sharpness, as I mentioned, Gamer 1 and Gamer 2 sort of mess this up a bit. But 50 in most presets will give you a neutral sharpness. 60, 70, 80. They over sharpen the image. Some people do prefer a, that kind of look, but uh, particularly if they're running lower resolution than the native resolution of the monitor, perhaps. Or if you decrease that, it gives a softer look to the image. Smart response settings, the pixel overdrive feature of the monitor. Off, fast, faster and fastest. Explore this in the review. Smart contrast, that's a dynamic contrast setting of the monitor, also explored in the review. Smart frame, which I mentioned earlier. You can change the gamma setting of the monitor, 1.8, 2.0, 2.2, 2.4, 2.6. Don't necessarily expect that these will be spot on what they, they say they will be. That's not necessarily the case. You can see in the review there are some deviations um, for some of the settings, but you can expect them to certainly reduce your gamma if you have them set to a lower number or increase your gamma if you have it set to a high number. Pixel orbiting. This is designed to reduce the chance of image retention and every now and then it'll just nudge the pixels momentarily one value and then nudge them again the other way. It's not something I actually noticed the monitor doing to be honest so it does it very infrequently and I would just leave this setting enabled. I didn't have any image retention issues on this monitor myself though anyway. Overscan and that just applies to all the legacy systems. PIP, P by P. There's a picture and picture and picture by picture settings for the monitor. It supports two different sources, the primary and secondary source. So it doesn't have four way P by P or anything like that. So that's picture in picture. You can have another source just displaying there. You can also change the size of that box or the position of that box on the screen. The input used in that box, so you can swap the sources as well. So you can have it a bit larger or larger again. And you can change the position, top right, top left, bottom right or bottom left. Swap the sources. And PBP, picture by picture. And this will give you an undistorted image to the left and right. It says change resolution to 1920 by 2160 for full screen. So if you're using that resolution, it will fill the whole screen. But this 
resolution 3840 by 2160, 16 by 9 aspect ratio. It doesn't want to distort it and stretch it, so it just keeps it with black borders around instead. Next, the smart size. I'm not sure why that's greyed out, to be honest. I think it only applies to HDMI connections. I've actually tried running the monitor at a non-native resolution as well, and this was still greyed out. Um, but I'm using DisplayPort, so maybe that is an issue there. I've now got the monitor hooked up using HDMI too, and the smart size settings are available. So these allow you to change the panel size so it simulates various different sizes. You can have 17 inch 5x4 for example, or various different sizes. These tend to make more sense if you're actually using that aspect ratio for the resolution you're running. So these 16x9 ones won't distort the image. If for example you wanted to have a 27 inch 16x9 you can do that and it has a black border around for the rest of the image. It might not be clear on the video but there's a black border above and below the image as well. Alternative, there's a one-to-one -one setting. So I'm running the native 3840 by 2160 at the moment, but if I switch this to full HD, you'll be able to see the black border it puts around the image. Using the one-to-one -one setting. So you can see there, there's a large black border around the image, the edge of the monitor, sort of where my hand is at the moment. Big black border around the image. There's also an aspect setting, so that will maintain the aspect ratio and it will fill out all of the pixels except that it'll make sure that it's not distorted if using a non 16 by 9 resolution. Whereas if you have the default selected, which is 31.5 16 by 9, it will always use an interpolation process and use all of the pixels on the monitor and it'll fill that up with your source resolution. So if it isn't 16 by 9, you will get some distortion. Um, in terms of the, the things either looking squashed or whatever it might be, depending on the resolution. Audio, so this allows you to adjust the volume of the integrated speakers or anything connected to the 3.5 millimeter jack. Standalone, um, again, I, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what this does. I think that is just how you select the 3.5 millimeter jack rather than the speakers or something like that. Um, you, can, you can check in the manual. Mute. You can mute the integrated speakers or anything connected to the 3.5mm headphone jack. And that's just the same as setting the volume to zero. Audio source. So you can adjust the audio source used by the monitor. So you can select audio input there, which would be the 3.5mm audio input jack. Or you can have it fed from the PC via the HDMI cable or DisplayPort cable, whatever you happen to be using. DTS, so this is DTS sound. This is basically sort of a spatial enhancement to the sound, if you like, a filter. Uh, audio isn't really my area, so I do talk about this a bit in the written review, so feel free to have a look at that. But as I say, it's not really my area, and I'm a monitor reviewer, not an audio reviewer. But if you have DTS disabled, there's an EQ setting which you can adjust. You can adjust various different aspects of the equalizer. I would mention though, um, you won't be able to hear this on the video, but if you have DTS enabled, there's kind of like, uh, and you don't have the speakers muted as I do right now, there's also, it's a bit of a pause when you first enable DTS, so I can't use the OSD at the moment, it sort of seems like it had crashed, but it's just a bit of a pause. But if you aren't playing any sound, you can kind of hear this static noise, this slight hissing noise. It's very faint to be honest, and some people won't really notice it. But I did notice it, so I would just recommend if you do want to use DTS and you're not using the speakers, just turn the volume down um, or mute it when you're not using the speakers. The easiest way to do that would just be to twiddle the joystick downwards and just set the volume to zero and that will mute the speakers for you. And then put it back up when you're using them. It's a little bit annoying having to do that if you do notice it, but that's just how it is. Next there's colour and that allows you to change the red, green and blue colour channels if you're using the user define setting. Or you can change the colour temperature to one of the values it has there. Native being the factory defaults. 6500K, 5000K. 5000K is essentially a low blue light setting. It's actually a very effective one and I explore this in the written review and I use this myself 
uh, in the hours leading up to bed as my low blue light setting. sRGB is an sRGB emulation setting, so that greatly reduces the colour gamut of the monitor and the saturation levels, and that's explored in the review as well. User define I went through before. Language, you can change the language that the OSD is displayed in, various different options. OSD settings, you can change the vertical and horizontal position of the OSD on the screen. You can enable a transparency effect if you want that. You can have it more transparent. OSD timeout, so that's how long after the last button press before the OSD will automatically disappear. Or you can just twiddle it left a few times to get rid of it yourself manually. Next is setup. Resolution notification. This just gives you a little notification on the screen to show you what resolution you're running and it will let you know if you're not running the native resolution. You can enable or disable adaptive sync, so that would allow you to use AMD FreeSync or NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode. Low input lag mode. This is a bit of a weird one. You can activate this in HDMI or disable it. I don't notice any drawback of having it enabled, but what I would say is if you're using DisplayPort, I'll just switch over to DisplayPort and show you this. I switch over to DisplayPort, you can see that the low input lag setting is greyed out. But for most of the review, um, particularly because I was using NVIDIA Adaptive Sync, and that's only actually active if you're using DisplayPort, you can't use G-Sync compatible mode via HDMI. So I was using DisplayPort for most of the review anyway. When I measured the input lag, it was low anyway via DisplayPort, even though this setting was greyed out. So essentially, don't worry about this setting. If you're using DisplayPort, it might well be greyed out for you. And I can't remember if this was actually the case with the AMD GPU as well. I think it was, uh, but certainly on my NVIDIA GPU, it's, it's greyed out, wouldn't worry about it. It has low input lag anyway. Reset, so that resets everything to the factory defaults. Information, that will allow you to see various things such as the serial number, the model number, or a shortened version of the model code, and also the current resolution and refresh rate. That's useful for a few reasons, the resolution and refresh rate. One is that you can tell if it is your monitor using interpolation if you're using a non-native resolution rather than the GPU scaling for you. So if you see this stuck at 3840 by 2160 even though you're running a lower resolution, that means your GPU is handling the scaling. So you should so you should adjust some settings in your graphics drive or try a different resolution. And if this matches the resolution you're actually running, that's good in terms of the monitor doing the scaling. Now running a game and I've got Adaptive Sync active, you can see that the refresh rate is now fluctuating and that's because it will match the frame rate if Adaptive Sync is active and it's within the variable refresh rate range of the monitor. So your game is running between 40 and 60 frames a second. That will reflect the frame rate of the content. Now, since I've got this open, I might as well just quickly show you what happens when HDR is enabled and the settings on the OSD, they do change. I've now got HDR enabled. So you can see it says it said HDR mode in the center of the screen when it first switched over. And a lot of this is now grayed out, a lot of the menu, especially lots of the picture menu. You can change the HDR mode, as I mentioned before, but you can't manually adjust things like the brightness or the contrast. The color menu is also locked out. You can, you can change the smart response setting, but the color menu is also locked out. So the monitor is now controlling things. HDR really is a careful coordination between the GPU and the monitor. So it's really being carefully controlled. So you can't manually adjust many things. But that's really all there is to the OSD on-screen display menu system of the Philips 326 M6 VJ RMB. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.